It's an honor for me to introduce our next speaker, uh, Lauren Snoble. Lauren is currently a master's student at the University of Montana working on the Blackfoot Clearwater Elk Project with Dr. Josh Millspa and Dr. Kelly Prophet from Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. Um, Lauren received her bachelor's degree from the University of Missouri in Fisheries and Wildlife Sciences. Before returning to graduate school, Lauren worked on a number of projects focused mainly on deer and elk research. So, if you would please uh, help me in welcoming Lauren. Great. Uh, thank you for that introduction. I appreciate it. And um, thanks for having me here today. It's um, exciting to kindly finally finish up with uh, this research and start presenting it to you all. Um, I'm going to start out with kind of giving an overview of how we know wildfire impacts elk nutrition and resource selection and then dive into some more specifics with my research um, where we looked at the effects of fire severity on elk nutrition and resource selection. Um, and as Jason said, this is a, a project in collaboration between Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks and the University of Montana um, and Dr. Kelly Prophet and Dr. Josh Millspot are co-authors on this research. So I'm not going to belabor this very much because we all know that there has been a steady increase in the number of fires in the western United States um, and those fires are burning more land and at a higher fire severity. And research suggests that the number of large scale and high severity fires is going to continue to increase in the future um, due to a combination of historical forest management practices and climate change. So as wildfires continue to impact the western United States, we need to understand how wildfire is going to impact wildlife habitat, as that's going to be key in managing populations against a backdrop of forest burned by fire and potentially against a backdrop of forest um, burned at a higher severity. And so my research has focused on elk, so we're going to focus on that. Um, we're going to talk about how wildfires impact summer nutrition for elk. And why do we care so much about summer nutrition? How is that going to um, better help us manage elk populations in the future? Well, first, summer nutrition is a major player in driving elk demography. So here we're just talking about the population dynamics of elk, births and deaths. And I'm going to get into this a little bit more in detail later. Additionally, we know that summer nutrition is going to impact elk behavior through migration and resource selection. So elk are going to move and select for areas um, with greater nutritional return. So if we can understand what that nutritional landscape looks like post-fire, we can get a better understanding of where elk are on the landscape and why they are hanging out there. So today I'm going to spend a good portion of time discussing the research looking at how fire severity impacts summer nutrition and then I'm going to provide some preliminary results um, looking at elk distributions post fire as well. So just to make sure we're all on the same page with what nutrition is, what that means for elk, um, we're going to define nutrition as a combination of forage quality, so that's how nutritious something is, and then forage quantity, how much of it is there. And we know that foraging behavior is also going to be extremely important for elk, as that determines um, the nutrition that elk are able to acquire. So just like us, elk are going to have to make decisions about what to eat and where to eat it, and kind of weigh the, the pros and the cons, the costs, and what nutrition they're actually going to be able to acquire. And I think a lot of people think of elk as being generalists, where they will just basically eat anything that's put in front of them. Um, but I'm going to argue and kind of work to show you today that they're a bit pickier um, than we originally thought. So in the summer, elk are going to select to eat specific plants and even specific plant parts. And they have to select for specific habitats across the landscape to forage in. 
So at a fine scale in the summer, elk are gonna select for grass and forb species, um, typically because they're more palatable and easily digested compared to those woody shrubs. And then elk are gonna typically select for more open areas um, because that's where more of those tasty graminoid and forb species are located. And so just to reiterate why we care about summer nutrition and how that could impact elk demography, um, historically folks believed that nutrition on the winter range was the main limiting factor for elk populations. However, recent research in the past decade or two have pointed to the important impacts of summer and fall nutrition on female elk reproduction and survival, as well as lactation and calf recruitment. So John and Rachel Cook um, are at the forefront of this research, looking at how summer forage quality impacts elk through their work with captive elk populations in Oregon. Um, an example that's a bit closer to home in Montana is some recent research that has come out of the Bitterroot and North Sapphires from Kelly Prophet and colleagues where they compared the nutritional resources for two separate elk herds. And they found that elk in one study area were exposed to lower summer nutritional resources, which led to a lower pregnancy rate um, compared to the herd subjected with higher summer nutritional resources. So now that we have a basic understanding um, of what elk nutrition is and what it means and how it impacts elk, Let's talk about um, what determines where and when summer nutritional resources will appear on the landscape. So we know season, phenology, landscape characteristics, and disturbances are going to interact in these really complex manners that affect vegetation communities and therefore the nutrition available for ungulates. So season and phenology are gonna be closely linked together. And phenology is just talking about that plant's age in that year. So is that plant emergent, flowering, fruiting, um, or turning brown and beginning to die? So as plants age, the nutritional quality is going to decline. That new plant growth is gonna yield the highest quality, but as you progress through the season into the late summer, um, and that plant begins to die, it's gonna become more fibrous, and that's gonna mean it's gonna be more difficult to digest and extract those nutrients. Next, um, landscape characteristics like aspect, elevation, and slope um, are going to impact the uh, plant communities, those plant traits, and also ultimately influence the phenology. Um, so that can impact summer nutrition for elk and then lastly, disturbances such as wildfire um, are going to alter those plant communities by shifting um, them from climax stages to those early seral stages. Um, so let's dive in and talk a little bit more about this disturbance piece and in particular wildfire and what we know um, about that and how it impacts summer nutrition for elk. So, in general, research has shown that fire improves forage quality and quantity for elk. That fire is gonna come through, remove all of that dead litter and woody vegetation in the understory, open up the canopy cover, and so more sunlight can then reach the forest floor. In turn, more of those nutritious grass and forb species are going to grow. In general, forage quality in burned areas increases due to um, a couple of mechanisms. So one, there is going to be more of those tasty, nutritious forb and grass species and less of those um, woody shrub species. And then two, there's gonna be an increase in the amount of that young plant tissue, which like I just said, um, is extremely nutritious and elk really like to eat it in the summer. So there have been a number of studies looking at how fire changes ungulate nutrition, um, and this has provided a strong background for understanding what we might expect to see uh, after a fire. Um, some other research coming out of the Bitterroot and North Sapphires from Kelly Prophet and colleagues looked at how time since fire impacted both forage quality and quantity in two different forest types. 
music in dry forests. In general, they found that forage quality was high a few years after the fire and decreased as time since fire increased. Additionally, they found that forage quantity also changed with time since fire and herbaceous forage biomass was gonna be high shortly after a fire um, and then decreased with increasing time since fire. And then for shrub forage biomass, that's going to typically be low shortly after a fire um, and then increase with time since fire. Some other factors that impact um, ungulate nutrition include season of burn, nutrient availability in the soil, forest type, and elevation aspect and slope. And all of this has provided a strong background for understanding how wildfire can impact the nutritional landscape for elk. However, um, research had not yet looked at how fire severity impacts nutrition for elk. So the, the, the impact of fire on um, a lot of ecological processes and a lot of research related to wildlife has frequently been treated as binary, so burned versus unburned. However, we know that large-scale wildfires don't burn evenly. They create a heterogeneous landscape based on both uh, fire severity and extent. And we care about this because potentially even small differences in nutrition between fire severity categories could lead to different nutritional availability for elk and could ultimately impact survival and reproduction. Additionally, um, shortly after a fire, we are likely to see a difference in both the abundance and composition of understory vegetation based on fire severity, which could have profound effects on elk nutrition and habitat. So that um, brings me to kind of the main objective for this project. Um, we were wanting to evaluate the effects of fire severity on elk forage quality and quantity shortly after a large scale wildfire in west central Montana. Um, we looked at two fire severity classes, low and high severity, as well as unburned forests in two different forested types. So let's walk through how um, vegetation communities differ between low and high severity burn forests and compared to unburned forests and how that could ultimately impact plant communities. So in unburned forests, um, we categorize unburned forests as not recently experiencing wildfire. They're going to have a canopy that is going to be intact, so lower levels of sunlight are going to be able to reach the forest floor. Um, and in turn, there's going to usually be higher shrub cover compared to burn forests. We considered low severity fires to be uh, characterized by the removal of understory vegetation through surface fires. You can kind of see here, there's some scorching at the bases of trees. Um, additionally, there's going to be some some tree mortality, but in general, the canopy cover is gonna be um, relatively intact. And then we considered high severity fires to be characterized by canopy trees being killed, needles being consumed, as well as surface fires coming through, removing that surface litter, understory vegetation, um, and organic soil later. So the vegetative response post-fire is gonna be influenced by fire severity through both time and space. Uh, there's gonna be differences in total vegetative cover um, shortly after a fire. So low severity fires are gonna have higher vegetative cover compared to high severity fires shortly after the burn. And this can ultimately impact the amount of forage available for elk. And then there's also typically differences in plant community composition so diversity in high severity burn fires, burn forests is gonna often be more homogeneous um, compared to low severity burns. And then also with changes in the canopy cover as well as soil, um, there's gonna be differences in phenology between those uh, fire severity categories and this can ultimately impact the forage quality for elk. So, Based on um, vegetative responses to fire severity shortly after a large scale fire, um, we hypothesized that herbaceous biomass 
shrub biomass, and forage quality would differ based on fire severity. For herbaceous forage quantity, we predicted that unburned forests would have the lowest, low severity burned forests would have the greatest herbaceous biomass, and high severity burned forests would fall somewhere in between. For shrub forage quantity, we predicted that unburned forests would have the greatest biomass. High severity burned forests would have moderate biomass. And low, sorry, low severity burned forests would have moderate biomass and high severity burned forests would have the lowest biomass. And then for forage quality, we predicted that unburned forests would have the lowest forage quality. Low severity burned forests would have the highest forage quality and high severity burn forests would fall somewhere in between. So we conducted our study in west central Montana near Sealy Lake and Ovando, looking at the Rice Ridge Fire of 2017. Um, the Rice Ridge Fire burned approximately 154,000 acres from late July through September in 2017, which you can see here in this orange shaded area on the map. In the end, it had burned about half of the Blackfoot Clearwater elk population's summer range identified by this black polygon. Pre-fire forest communities were dominated by spruce, fir, forests, and woodlands. Throughout the rest of the talk, um, I'll be referring to these as music forests. And then um, additionally, mixed conifer forests made up a large proportion of the study area, with dominant conifers being um, Douglas fir, uh, ponderosa pine, western larch, and lodgepole pine. Throughout the rest of the talk, I'll be referring to this forest community as dry forests. So the Rice Ridge Fire was a multi-severity fire, and it created a heterogeneous landscape. In the end, 54% burned as high severity, and 46% burned at low severity. So how do we tackle this question um, to figure out how fire severity impacts nutritional resources for elk? Um, well, first we needed to figure out what our elk ate. Um, so how do we go from this to this nice table that gives us the list of all the important forage species? Um, well, we know that what, what goes in um, must come out. So we went out and collected a bunch of pellet samples across the landscape. Um, and then we send those samples off to the lab where they can extract the plant DNA from those pellets. And then those DNA sequences act like a barcode where we can match the barcode that's in our pellet samples to the plant DNA sequences in a reference library. And that gives us uh, this nice elk population diet list. And then we had to go out and sample vegetation across the landscape within those two different forest types, those music and dry forests. And then in those three different fire severity categories, so unburned, low severity, and high severity. Um, and our vegetation sampling plots consisted of running a 40 meter long transect. We identified all the plant species as well as percent cover and dominant phenological stages within each of those meter squared quadrats. Um, to be able to estimate forage quality, and then we clip vegetation um, as well to be able to estimate quantity. And we sampled over 780 sites in two years shown by these black dots on the map. So we climbed mountains, foraged rivers, and endured the elements from May through August of 2019 and 2020, all in the name of uh, sampling plants where some of my technicians occasionally tried to channel their inner elk and see which plants were tastier themselves. Um, but that method proved to be fairly inefficient. So we, um, like the good scientists we are, use the actual data from our diet analysis and vegetation sampling to quantify the forage quality and quantity at each of our vegetation sampling plots. So our metric for forage quality is digestible energy. This is measured as kilocalories per gram of forage. Um, and this is so, it's just a measure of how nutritious something is. Um, and this digestible energy metric has been linked with pregnancy rates and body condition in elk. Um, so there are some ties back to how nutrition could potentially impact elk demography. And we then use this site-based nutritional information and developed a landscape nutrition model 
where we incorporated a number of spatial and temporal features of those sites, like elevation, tree canopy cover, um, and precipitation, figure out which combination of features best predicted what the forage quality and quantity would be at a particular site. And then we use those models to predict nutrition across the entire landscape. So I'm gonna dive into some of our results here. Um, starting with our diet analysis, we found that the summer diet was comprised of 10 forb, seven shrub, and four graminoid taxa. The most common diet species within each of these respective life forms was fireweed for forbs, sedges within the graminoid life form, and huckleberry for shrubs. Um, and based on our diet analysis, we believe that over 50% of the elk's diet in the study area is fireweed, so that's a huge percentage. And if you ever go out in this landscape, you can just look at all the tops of the fireweed. They've just been munched down by, by elk, and I'm sure deer are eating them as well. And then if we combine these three species together, we're looking at about 60% of this elk population's diet. So these three species are extremely important in this study area. So now let's take a look at our forage species list. So everything that's on the y-axis here um, was identified as a forage species in our elk population. And we're gonna look at where they are most commonly found on the landscape. So this figure is gonna show us the proportion of vegetation sampling plots with dry, within dry forests that contain each forage species. And just to reiterate, this is just focused on if a species was detected in a plot, not taking into account um, the percent cover of it. So unburned forests are gonna be shown in blue, low severity in yellow, and high severity in orange. So we can see here that sedges and huckleberry are going to be commonly found within each of the fire severity categories. About 70% of plots within each of the fire severity categories contain sedge, and about 50 to 65% of plots contain huckleberry. And then we can see with our fireweed, um, Fireweed is found in over 80% of sampling sites within both low and high severity burn forests um, and clearly not very common in our unburned forests. And then moving over to our mesic forests, we see that our huckleberry species are found in about 65 to 70% of our sampling plots. Again, fireweed is found in about 80% of both low and high severity burn forests and not commonly found in unburned forests. And sedges are about 50% less common than in our dry forest types, and they're found in about 35% of plots within each of those categories. Now moving on to our forage quantity and quality. So we took our sampling plots, and we filtered specifically to what was identified as a forage species. So each of these um, plots I'm gonna show you are just focused specifically on the amount of herbaceous forage biomass or the amount of uh, shrub biomass, and then um, the amount of forage quality. So what we found was that low and high severity forests had higher herbaceous biomass compared to unburned forests in both forest types. We see a slight trend that low severity burned forests had uh, greater forage biomass compared to high severity burned forests. Um, but based on our modeling, this was not a significant difference. Um, so our main takeaway here is that fire improved the quantity of herbaceous forage in years two and three post-fire. So up next for shrub forage biomass, we found the reverse to be true, which is not surprising. Um, unburned forests had the greatest shrub forage biomass compared to forests burned by either fire severity. And now let's dive into forage quality. Um, as a reminder, our forage quality metric is digestible energy. Um, and as I previously stated, this has ties back to pregnancy rates and survival. So as a quick reference, anything that is above 2.75 kilocalories per gram of forage is usually considered good where there's not gonna be really any nutritional limitations on reproduction or survival. Now, if you below, fall below that 2.75 mark, there begins to be some constraints on lactation and pregnancy rates, 
And if you fall low enough, you could potentially run into some issues with overwinter survival. So here we see that forage quality is higher in both low and high severity burn forests of both forest types. And we can also see that digestible energy in unburned music forests falls handily into that inadequate range, which could potentially lead to a reduction in reproductive output or survival if your summer range is made up primarily of this um, forest type. So our main takeaway here is that fire improved forage quality regardless of fire severity in our system. So as I mentioned, we then built predictive models where we incorporated a number of environmental and landscape covariates. Um, and I'm gonna show you some of these models predicted out across the landscape. So at this landscape level scale, I'm just gonna focus on digestible energy um, because that has links to elk performance. So we're gonna first take our landscape and turn back the clock and pretend that the Rice Ridge fire never happened. Soon I'm gonna show you a GIF of how forage quality changes across the landscape from May through August. And I've grouped forage quality into two groups. So adequate forage quality above that 2.75 mark where there aren't any nutritional limitations. And then inadequate forage quality below that 2.75 mark where there could be um, some limitations on elk performance. Adequate forage quality is gonna be shown in green and then inadequate is gonna be in this dark charcoal color. Um, and then just as a reminder, this black outline here is the Blackfoot Clearwater Elk population summer range. Okay, so let's watch how nutrition changes across the landscape if there was never a fire. Um, so what do we notice here? There were a lot of green areas representing adequate forage quality in May. And as we moved through to August, those areas contracted and got smaller and smaller. Most of these areas were at mid to low elevations. And as we progress through the summer, some of those higher elevational areas green up and then have adequate forage quality. But for the most part, those higher elevational areas don't cross the threshold from inadequate to adequate. So, in an unburned landscape, we end up seeing a net loss in the percent of the landscape that has adequate forage quality when we move through May through August. So we know that the Rice Ridge fire did in fact happen. Um, so let's look and see what the nutritional landscape for elk looked like in years two and three after the fire. Um, just as a reminder, this is where the Rice Ridge fire burned and kind of keep this rough kidney shape in your mind as we watch this next um, video. Again, green is going to be adequate and um, dark charcoal is going to be inadequate. So what do we notice from this one? We again started out with a lot of area with adequate forage quality in May. Those lower elevational areas within this kidney-shaped burn perimeter never decreased into the inadequate category. And as we progressed through the summer, those higher elevational areas within the burn perimeter greened up and were added to the adequate forage quality category. Therefore, in a burn landscape, we saw a net gain in the percent of the landscape with adequate forage quality over time. And let's watch this one one more time as well, just to drive home the point. So here is a still of the two predicted landscapes next to each other to compare the differences in August. We can extrapolate a bit and think about the image on the left as what the nutritional landscape looked like before the fire. And the image on the right is what the landscape looked like a couple years after the fire. Pretty substantial differences here. And the late summer is actually one of the most critical nutritional periods for female elk. So those that gave birth in the spring and have been rearing a calf throughout the summer need adequate nutrition during this period of time to regain body fat. If nutritional resources are inadequate during the late summer, female elk may actually pause reproduction and not become pregnant that fall. But if there's adequate forage quality in the late summer, 
lactating females can regain fat reserves and become pregnant. So that was a lot of information with the nutrition, but just to kind of wrap it up nicely before we move on to our next part, our key findings showed support for fires in years two and three post-fire improving forage quality in music and dry forests regardless of fire severity. Forbs and graminoids provide the higher quality forage in the summer, and as we saw in those herbaceous and shrub um, biomass box plots, we found that both low and high severity burn forests have a higher ratio of herbaceous to shrub forage compared to unburned forests. Our results also indicate that unburned music forests appear to have the lowest forage quality and quantity compared to the other forest types, which could potentially lead to limitations on reproduction and survival. So we found that wildfire improved nutritional resource availability in our study area, but we know that the acquisition of nutritional resources may vary based on a function of risk. So what are the costs elk face when they are deciding where to forage? Well, we know that elk require variable habitats for foraging and cover. Um, and here I'm defining cover as vertical vegetative structure that elk could use to hide behind to reduce their vulnerability to predation or harvest. And we know that wildfires are gonna alter the structural characteristics and distribution of both of these required habitats. So for example, let's think about a high severity burned forest patch. In our study area, we found that high severity burned areas had a positive impact and increased forage quality. However, the fire may have um, a negative impact on cover. So that fire is gonna come through, reduce the amount of thick shrubs and trees that an elk can hide behind, potentially increasing elk vulnerability to predation and human harvest, depending on what pressures are on the landscape. So even though high severity burn forests provide good forage quality in our study area, Elk could potentially avoid these areas and never utilize this high quality forage if they perceive that there is also a higher risk. So that brings us to um, the next part of the talk where we are going to look at elk distributions post fire. Were the elk in our study area actually able to acquire those nutritional resources um, in the burn? So here our main question was, how are female elk selecting resources in a recently burned landscape? So there's been previous research looking at elk resource selection post fire, and previous studies have shown that elk frequently select for burned areas, which is likely a function of an increase in nutritional resources, so it's gonna be more efficient for elk to forage in those areas. However, research has not looked at elk selection in relation to fire severity. So although we found minimal differences between low and high severity burn forests for nutritional resources, there could be differences in the amount of cover available for elk um, depending on the fire severity category. So again, cover is that vertical vegetative structure that elk could use to hide behind. And based on the amount of vegetation removed by fire, we would expect that high severity burned forests would have the lowest amount of cover, unburned forests would have the greatest amount of cover, and low severity burned forests would fall somewhere in between. Now cover is also an important component of elk habitat, as previous studies have shown that elk may avoid areas with less cover, even if there are good nutritional resources, if they perceive a higher risk. So if cover was important in our system, we would expect to see elk avoiding burn forests, and potentially expect to see greater avoidance of high severity burn forests compared to low severity burn forests. So to be able to look at this, um, we captured in GPS collared approximately 50 female elk, and we received a GPS location every hour. And additionally, we placed about 270 motion activated game cameras across the landscape within those three different fire severity categories, unburn, low, and high. And we used this GPS collar information and game camera to be able to 
develop what's called a resource selection probability function. Um, and this tool allows us to compare habitat characteristics between the used GPS locations and a random set of available points to determine what resources are important for elk. So I'm going to show you some preliminary results looking at how elk are using the landscape during that late summer period um, because that's the important time, um, one of the most important times for elk to be able to acquire good nutritional resources. So we looked at resource selection in relation to six different uh, land cover or habitat types. Unburned low and high severity are in conifer forests. Open is combining grasslands and irrigated agricultural lands together, um, as well as shrublands. And then closed is combining riparian and deciduous forests together. On our y-axis, we have probability of use. So closer to one means elk are more likely to use those areas. Um, and we found that during this late August period, elk are more likely to use burned forests. And we found no difference in use between low and high severity burned forests. Additionally, we found that elk were more likely to use unburned conifer forests compared to the remaining three habitat types. We then looked at elk resource selection in relation to forage quality. And we found that elk are selecting for areas with greater digestible energy. This suggests that elk may be attracted to burn forests because of an increase in foraging efficiency. Additionally, what is interesting to point out is that it appears that elk are really selecting for areas with greater than or equal to that 2.75 uh, kilocalorie per gram mark which is what was considered as adequate forage quality. And I think this really helps drive home the point that elk are kind of picky. They're going to find and eat those plants that are going to provide the highest quality nutrition to them. And then finally, let's look at resource selection in relation to distance to dense canopy cover. Um, so this is distance in meters to areas with greater than or equal to 40% canopy cover. Um, and of course, previous research has shown that elk are going to frequently like to hang out near forest edges so they can quickly escape into cover. Um, and here in our study area, we actually see a slight trend that elk are more likely to use areas further away from dense canopy. Um, and this again just suggests that elk are really using those burned areas and cover may not be as important during this time period. So fire increased forage quality um, and likely reduced cover. And based on our results, we found that elk are using both low and high severity burn forests where they are able to access high quality forage, which is great because they need it during this period of time so that they can regain fat reserves and become pregnant that fall. A potential reason why we didn't see a difference in use between the two fire severity categories is likely because of low predation risk. So there was no human hunting on the landscape at this time, and several previous studies have noted that elk risk to predation is relatively low during this period of time. And thus elk are able to use a burn forests of either fire severity freely where higher forage quality occurred. So what's next? This study was only looking at years two and three post-fire. And we know that as we move through time, those forest structures are going to change, potentially impacting elk habitat in the future. Well, in years two and three post-fire, we found minimal differences in nutritional resources and resource selection. But as these fires, um, the forest change uh, in uh, structure, we could expect to see uh, differences in nutritional resources in the future as the composition and phenology of vegetation communities changes. Additionally, site-specific variation in climate change is going to potentially influence the effects of fire severity on forage quality and quantity for elk. For example, high severity burned dry forests that experience sustained hot and dry conditions post-fire could see forests transitioning to grasslands
um, which could change both the forage quality and quantity for elk. And then lastly, as time since fire increases, uh, more fire killed snags are gonna fall, potentially negatively influencing locomotion for elk in burned areas in the future. So high severity burn forests have the most fire killed trees and therefore may experience a greater number of down logs in the future, potentially making travel costly. Following this increase in down logs, elk may avoid high severity burn forests in the future even if there are good nutritional resources available to them. So as large scale wildfires are becoming increasingly common, um, we believe our study in the Blackfoot Valley has improved our knowledge on how fire impacts elk nutrition and resource selection. Fire severity is a main component of these large scale wildfires um, and our study was the first to address the effects of fire severity on both elk nutritional resources as well as elk distributions. So this was a large project and I just wanna um, thank a few groups. Um, it would have been really tough to pull this off without the support and funding from these organizations. So we appreciate all the assistance from these groups and the numerous individuals that helped this project be completed. Um, and with that, I think I've left plenty of time for questions. So I'm happy to answer anything folks have. Yeah. We've got 13 minutes, so plenty of time to ask questions. So. Yeah, go for it. So it looks like you showed that the quantity, quality of forage improved significantly within the Rice Ridge fire, and it's been five years since the fire. Were you able to look at the population numbers to see if they increased? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so I believe before the fire, the population was around 12 to 1400. Um, the surveys the year after the fire showed their population to be around 1000. Um, so what likely happened was that year of the fire, they likely were moved off of their summer range and had to eat um, less quality forage. And my guess would be that there were pretty low pregnancy rates that year. And so, of course, a few elk are gonna die with the fire, not very many do. Um, so there was a decrease in, in, the, in the population a little bit there. We were not able to directly relate it back to any sort of population growth. We do know that their pregnancy rates are over 90%, which is considered to be pretty good. Um, and based off of our, when we captured them, what their body fat, their condition looks like, they seem to be in pretty good condition. Um, and I will also state that before this fire happened, they had kind of noticed a trend in recruitment rates decreasing. Um, and so they were actually looking to do some um, habitat projects to improve uh, nutrition for elk. Um, and then this fire came through and kind of, I think, did a lot of that for them. Um, so yeah, the, their pregnancy rates and body condition looks pretty good, but we haven't done any sort of formal analyses on population dynamics post-fire. And I recognize that there are other things that affect population. Sure. Well. Yeah. Okay. Yep. In the study area, uh, in your opinion, I mean, what, when would you expect a positive increase in nutrients, you know, from the plants, shrubs to go back? They, uh, price would go on in the future. Yeah, that's a great question, and maybe I should reiterate for folks online. Um, he asked when we think we might see. Uh, the nutritional increases to kind of go back to normal. Is that right? Okay. Um, so that prophet um, and colleagues that I talked about um, a little bit, they showed that about 15 years post fire, that's about when they found those nutritional increases to kind of even out and be the same as an unburned forest. 
Um, but that can also change um, if we see these forests shifting to, say, a grassland community um, due to climate change. Um, so it could potentially be a, a longer period of time where these high severity burn forests have good quality um, nutrition for elk if they do shift to those grasslands. Yeah, so are, are our results applicable to other areas in terms of, can you repeat that last yeah, part of the question? in terms of like uh, maybe planning for targeting a percentage of, uh, you know, condition low, low to high severity and percentage of the landscape. Yeah, no, I think that's a great question. Um, so this area it has a lot of moisture, right? Like being near Sealy Lake, we think of that as lots of huckleberries, that's where all the links are. Um, and so I think this study area in particular, we didn't find a difference between low and high severity burn forest because there is so much moisture, so vegetation was able to regenerate um, post fire pretty well. Um, and so I think it could be a little tricky when extrapolating it to other, other areas that may not have as much moisture. Um, and so I think it's hard for me to give you know, a, a, good, a good answer here just because there is so much variation, which I know is um, a frustration with researchers not being able to answer something directly. Um, but I, th I think overall, um, you know, the fire is going to improve nutrition. Whether you see as much of an improvement um, in other areas that have less moisture, I think that's to be determined. Um, but I think fire in most systems are going to improve the nutrition for elk. Um, and especially with fireweed, um, if your system has a lot of fireweed, fireweed, even when it's senescent, has really good forage quality. It's still above that 2.75 mark. And so that's why we found this general increase um, in the percent of the landscape that had adequate forage quality into that late summer period. Um, so yeah, I don't think I have any prescriptions on percent of the landscape that needs to be burned to show an overall increase. I think fire in general is going to improve, improve that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you know if there's any studies being done or have been done? If in logging areas, you know, where you've got basically the same thing as a, you know, fire going through, but not the same uh, quality of the burn. And sure. Nitrogen is put back in the soil. And, right. Yeah. Yeah, so logging without any sort of prescribed fire or wildfire, yeah. just strict yeah. logging. Um, they are actually starting up a project, Fish, Wildlife, and Parks in the University of Montana, um, looking at that, um, and so I think there's going to be some future future results coming out. Um, off the top of my head, I don't know of anything. Um, you know, I think anything that's going to remove your overstory canopy is going to improve the amount of herbaceous biomass you have. Um, so, like in terms of beetle killed forests, they frequently see that increase in herbaceous uh, forage as well. So I would imagine that overall logging after you're going to see that increase in herbaceous yeah, forage. Well, that'll be that because we we have this 40 acres that we had it logged, and then the elk started showing. Up yeah, from yeah. The neighbor's property that's you know pretty well covered. Yeah, I think anything that's going to remove that overstory canopy is going to be overall good for yeah. for herbaceous forage. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. Yeah, I do not know of anything off the top of my head. Um, I think one thing that we could potentially see as climate um, changes in the future with increased temperatures, you know, there potentially could be some 
um, earlier senescence of vegetation that could ultimately impact the forage quality for elk so that, that um, plant material is just going to become more fibrous and more difficult for uh, elk to digest earlier on um, instead of just in that late summer period. But I don't know of anything off the top of my head, but that's a great, that's a great question. Got time for a couple more if you want. All right, well, hearing none, <laughs> I guess well, let's give one more. Yeah, thank you guys. We've got a little gift for oh, you as well you. to uh, give you a token of our appreciation. So, so we're just coming up on the noon hour and lunch is.